Good morning. Good to see you all. I'm glad to be home. I missed you last week, but I heard that the service went really, really well um, outside in the hot weather. Um, come on now. <laughs> uh, I have one announcement to make that is an important announcement. There are apricots available out in the foyer on the, on the bench, and I have word that if you, that is not enough, that Gary and, uh, and Diane Ackerman have large quantities of apricots that they're willing to share out on their tree. So just talk to Gary or Diane and, and get as many apricots as you can possibly handle. So not you. You've done enough apricots. <laughs> so you've got five gallons. All- oh, man. Okay. So it is the season that keeps on giving when it comes to that. So zucchini's coming on, so make sure you keep your windows rolled up and your car locked. So, but uh, the, they're available out there, and we want you to enjoy the, the fruit, of, fruit of the season. So that's, that's it. I'm glad to be home. Gary, can you begin our service today? Well, come on up. Great big welcome to everyone, new or, or old or coming. It seems to be a week of people coming back uh, and going home. And I guess where I've got the podium, I can talk about myself, so that's what I'm going to do for a second here. Our kids from Vermont came and stayed. They went home to Vermont, and their house was there. <laughs> and Dana and his wife, they are in northern Vermont, and I believe they're OK. They live on a hill. Uh, also, I did make it to 70, just, just, just saying, just saying. And also, KTVB made it to 70 because I've known all my life that TV came in this valley on my birthday. So, uh, and I had someone, a neighbor of mine who was a, a farmer when we, we met him, well, we saw him at Chapala's, they were eating and we hadn't seen him for months. And we were talking about 70 years. And he says, Gary, he says, do you realize? I says, yeah, I knew that. He was shocked that I knew that. Anyway, I told him he couldn't retire because he was too smart to retire if he could remember that KTVB came in 1953. Anyway, um, lots are going on, going on. I'm grateful that all the campers are back, that our kids made it home safely. Um, and I have... Uh, a landowner who came to see her farm probably for the last time before she moves back in with her relatives in Oregon. Uh, with that, I just welcome everyone, and I'm just going to say a shout out to Sue. I do pray for Dennis, and I try, but I haven't made it out to see him, and I feel bad about it. But I'm here today. Okay. Before I read our scripture, I want to say welcome back, John. You've been missed, and I, and, um, and I know you have, and I want you, want you to be sure that you feel that. Also, the last bulletin, I mean the, the bridge that we got, there was a lot in the uh, letter that John wrote in here about. Anyway, I just think if you didn't read it, I think you need to. And there's a lot to process in there for a lot of different peoples. It has a, it, it, it meant a lot to me. It, it doesn't really mean it's going to mean a lot to you, but it, there's a chance. So if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, I think it would be well worth your time. Okay. Uh, our scripture for this morning is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. And if I have the book open in the right spot, I might be in the right spot for this morning. Uh, we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be, though we once judged Christ in that way. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The person is forgotten, and everything is new. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and he has given us the work of making peace between himself and others. Yes, amen to that. I totally agree. So if you bear with me this morning, we'll have a prayer of opening and we'll 
have some music. And I hear we have special music. Yes? Wonderful, because I love singing and special music. Okay. Dear Lord, I appreciate everyone who shows today to come and worship and to be and to com uh, communicate with, with all of us and to share what is going on in our lives. With that, we are, we are so thankful for you. Amen. Thank you, Gary. The first song we're going to sing this morning is In My Life, God Be Glorified. It's a simple little melody, but it really speaks to me that I want God to be visible in my life. I want to glorify him in my life, in my church, and in our home. So if you'd stand with me, we'll sing that song. 1027. In my As we pre uh, prepare for our giving, um, I'm going to do some more about me. <laughs> our grandkids are participating in the horse deal at the fair. And my granddaughter said, Grandpa, we made you proud. And your name was t spit out time and time and time again. And my comment to them was, when you do hard work and you keep at it, the end result can be satisfaction and happiness. And that's what I believe I gave to them. And Marianne gave to them. And that's what we give to everybody in support. So let's have a prayer, a moment of prayer for our giving here in the church. Dear God, we're here today to support you and your mission and all the people that need to know you and that do know you. We give all that we can to support all the things that we try to do for the underprivileged, the people that are less than I, the people that need our help. 
In all this, we pray. Amen. gifts the, and the givers and the generous hearts that are so represented here. We thank you for all that you've given to us. May it be used for your service. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Kids, come on up. You're going to leave the chair there? Oh, oh. Hi, Nancy. Sit down. Okay, so who knows what this is? A sunflower. A sunflower. That's exactly right. Is it fake or real? Oh, it's real. We have many of these growing at our place. <coughs> Oop, easy. You all right? Yeah. Okay, good. So this sunflower, it's just one type of sunflower. There's a lot of different kinds. Where does that come from? Not my house, but originally as a plant, where did it come from? What do you think? Want to take a guess? Sunflowervania? Sunflowervania. <laughs> I suppose if you want to call this a sunflowervania, what are, what's in the bag here? Sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds. Oh, you planted one and then you got one. Well, these didn't get planted and got those, but these are the seeds that, that grow into sunflowers. You want to try it? You can eat these. You want to try one? No, you're, you're saying no. Okay, there you go. No? Summer, you want to try one? Nancy, do you want to try a sunflower seed? There you go. They're just something to eat. But these grow into sunflowers. Now, you can tell the difference between this tiny little seed and this big flower, right? This is much bigger. This is just a tiny little thing. Did you know that everything that this plant needs to grow into the big, giant, tall flower that it is, is contained in this seed with some rain and some sunshine and some nutrients in the soil? All of this comes out of this. That's called potential. Did you know that you guys have... Like they taste like mashed potatoes? Kind of. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll work on that too. So you guys are like seeds. You have lots of potential to grow and blossom into something as you get older. Isn't that kind of cool to think about? God sees us not as tiny little seeds that are just kind of like little kernels. God sees the potential in us to grow into something wonderful. And God wants us to grow into something wonderful. And so God gives us everything that we need to do that. Now, we need to listen to God and obey God, but every one of us has a lot of potential to be something beautiful. Do you guys feel like that sometimes? I don't really like it. You don't really like it? You don't have to eat him. <laughs> I'll take the one. You are, you're going to try to plant them? Okay. Oh, my word. So... Let's remember that we all have wonderful potential and that God has good plans for us to grow into something beautiful. You want to pray together? Come on, Summer, let's pray. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the potential that you put inside us and all the promise that each one of us has. We pray that we would be faithful with what you've given us and grow into the beautiful things that you envisioned for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go.
The next song we're going to sing is called I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And I remember the day that I decided that in my life I was going to follow Jesus. It's been a lot of years. But sometimes life happens and we have to decide every day that we're going to follow Jesus. Sometimes it's every hour or every minute. But I hope you decide today to follow Jesus. Please stand with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Well, howdy. <laughs> I mentioned last week uh, we had a wonderful time with the uh, outdoor church. I liked that. That was unique and uh, enjoyable. And you know, worship, uh, just a few years ago I met a young uh, minister, and he, he made me realize that worship is not an event. Worship is a way of life. And uh, as a part of worship, one of the major elements, even back in the time of the Old Testament, is music. We love music. My wife and I have been singing together for a little while. How old are you? Uh, <laughs> for a little while, and uh, we, we love music. And uh, music itself is a part of the worship. And what I've enjoyed about your church, our church, is that um, everyone sings. I, I watch and I listen and, and um, just enjoy the music as we um, sing together. And I enjoy so much the pastor's uh, messages as well. And so we, we, we're going to sing, but we want to invite you that uh, music being a part of worship, if, if the song we sing is familiar, please feel free to join in with us, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart and my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Jesus, 
Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. <clears throat> Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. my soul for Jesus has saved me freed me from sin that long had enslaved me his precious blood he gave to redeem now I belong to him now I belong to Jesus Jesus belongs to say that um, worship is not a spectator sport and uh, since I didn't see too many of you singing I'm going to ask Marta if, uh, to just give an A flat chord sing Amazing Grace this is Amazing Grace that brings it all to Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like sending you all home now after that that was beautiful thank you and that was just wonderful uh, what a change Jesus has wrought oh. I want to invite you to turn to the book of Philemon be careful you might pass it it's a short one one page in my Bible just a brief little letter. We're going to take a look at Philemon. We're going to think about and reflect on the change that Jesus has wrought in our lives. I want to begin by reading the first seven verses of this, of this short letter. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward our Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. As he sat down to work on his correspondence, Paul recognized that he had a problem. Nothing new there, he probably thought. Uh, This had become something of a pattern, really. Paul would come into a community, a village, a city, and then he would proclaim the good news. And in every community, there were some that would respond to that gospel. The Spirit of God always went in front of Paul, preparing people's hearts and their souls for the message that Paul would bring. Those receptive people, they would form a little community, and they'd often meet in the home of one of their wealthier converts, and then they would go about the business of living and learning and growing, enacting that Christian life that they had been called to. And Paul would stay with them for a while. He would be there teaching, and then, led by that same spirit, he would set out on a new missionary journey. Sometimes it wasn't voluntary. Sometimes he got run out of town against his will. Not everybody was so receptive to his message. But always, Paul understood that God was compelling him to go forth and to preach the word. And it had to be hard for him. You see, in every little congregation, in every city, in every town, Paul made friends. He got close to people. These were his sisters and his brothers, his Christian family, and he loved them. And so when he had to move on, it was always with a little regret, a little uncertainty. Would they hang in there? Would they remain faithful to their calling? Would they honor their first love? Sometimes as he'd moved on, Paul would receive word from these congregations. There'd be a letter or maybe a messenger would seek him out. There were often questions, a lack of clarity about how they should live, what it meant to be faithful, those sorts of things. At other times, word would reach Paul that there was some division in the churches that he'd left behind. There were factions and arguments. There was the infiltration of false doctrine and false apostles would come along and after him and and muddy the the commitment of these little communities, uh, what they needed to have in following their Lord. And so Paul would, if he couldn't make a visit, sit down and write a letter trying to sort out the problems that they were facing. He would encourage, he would instruct, he would challenge, he'd even rebuke. When he couldn't be there, he would send a letter. And not every letter was easy to write. So Paul sat there with that blank parchment in front of him. He just finished the letter that he was going to send on to the church in Colossae, the one that he knew would be shared broadly, be read in all the community churches there in that Lycus Valley. In that letter, he was speaking to the whole dispersed community. So he was writing in broad theological strokes. He knew that the tone of that letter had to be apostolic. It had to carry the weight and the influence of his authority and his calling. But this letter, well, this letter, it was a different kind of letter. Sitting there in his little room in the place where he'd set up his writing table and his lampstand, Paul could hear the activity in other parts of the house. He could hear the scuffle of feet and the clatter of dishes, the quiet conversations. He could hear the voices of his colleagues, his co-workers. He could hear Luke's measured tones. He could hear Epaphras and Mark and Demas talking about something or other. He couldn't make it out. And he could hear one other voice there, a newer voice, mixed into the conversation. He could hear the voice of Onesimus. Onesimus was the troublesome subject that Paul needed to write to his good friend Philemon about because Onesimus was here with Paul and not 
with Philemon where he was supposed to be. I mean, what do you say? What do you say about a runaway slave? It's a little odd that we have this letter, one of the shortest books in the whole Bible. It's an incredibly personal letter written specifically to a single individual, even though Paul knew that others would be listening in. And it's so short, it doesn't have chapters, it's just verses here that we, we, we divide up. And it's got this very intimate and personal subject matter. Paul is writing to Philemon about his slave, Onesimus. You see, Onesimus had run away from his master and had somehow found Paul, come into Paul's little missionary community. Whether he'd sought Paul out or whether it was just chance, they just somehow connected, we're not sure. But regardless, Paul is stuck here in a dilemma. How to address this issue with Onesimus? And because perhaps it's a little unfamiliar to us, we need to unpack the dilemma a bit, the characters in the story, and take a look at the problem that Paul is facing. So in the introduction to the letter, what we just read today, Philemon is identified as a co-worker with Paul, and not just a co-worker, but a beloved co-worker. What this tells us is that Philemon had responded to this gospel message that Paul had proclaimed. He had been, as we noted, prepared by God's own spirit. His heart had been open to what Paul was going to share. And when Paul came into town, Philemon was ready, ready to receive Jesus. And then Philemon went even further, not content just to receive that message and celebrate this wonderful gift of grace, certainly worth celebrating. Philemon began to work for the good of the church and the coming reign of God. This is not a pew sitter we're talking about here. This is someone who is a co-worker, a beloved co-worker. So he's got some common spirit here, some common heart with Paul. And I don't think we should miss this. The Greek is a little more clear than our English. Even though Paul addresses this letter to Philemon and these others, uh, Aphia and and Archippus and the the church in Philemon's home, he switches pronouns in verse 4 from the plural to the singular He's talking about one person here, the you, that's Philemon. And we can see in these first few verses that Paul really does have a deep love for this very singular addressee to the letter. He loves Philemon. He knows of Philemon's love for the saints, his faith in Jesus, how he received such a great deal of joy and encouragement because of Philemon's love and his commitment to the refreshment of the saints is the way he phrases it and so in these first few verses we get a picture of Philemon it's a pretty good picture this is the kind of guy I think we'd all like to know at least this is the way Paul sees him he's an asset to the church he's a beloved co-worker but he's also a slave owner We need to try and clear up our picture of slaves in the first century to understand this situation a little better. You see, slavery was common back then. It was really common. It was just part of the atmosphere. There was really no framework at all that presented any kind of an alternative. You just couldn't even imagine a society without slaves. The whole functioning of the culture from the halls of power, the highest level, all the way down to the most humble kitchen, all of it was dependent on slaves. And so slavery was just part of that that fabric of life. Pretty much every household of means would have one or two or 20. Unlike our understanding of slavery today, the first century slavery, it existed on something of a, a sort of a continuum. Slaves would often be granted their freedom, either because they'd served their masters really well and it was a reward to them, or they'd maybe aged out of their usefulness and so their masters would set them free. And so slaves could gain their freedom, and they did so on a regular basis. It created a whole class in the society known as freedmen. This class of freedmen was was pretty common. They weren't full participants in the Roman society, but they weren't slaves either. Freedmen were still beholden to their former masters. 
Now this is connected to something else that was very prominent in their culture, this social custom of patrons and clients, patrons taking care of clients, wealthy people acting as patrons to poorer folks, and the lower classes being obligated to those wealthier people. Now slaves were property, they were owned, but a freedman was, was a client, still bound to their patron, but technically free. It was this whole system of patronage and honor and shame that Paul needs to tackle here in his letter to Philemon because the Christian life is profoundly different. So slaves existed in this fabric at the very lowest level of the social hierarchy. There really wasn't anyone lower than this. And the hierarchy would be slaves and then freedmen and then free clients and then wealthy patrons who were themselves probably clients of even wealthier patrons all the way on up to the Caesar. And regardless of how well they might have been treated, and some were treated quite well like family members, slaves were still property. They didn't have freedom, they didn't have autonomy, they didn't have choice. They could be used and abused however the master saw fit. Now we can probably assume that Philemon was a pretty good master, perhaps a moral patron, uh, but we're still talking slavery here. And Onesimus was a slave. And there was always this temptation for slaves to try to better themselves, better their lot, even if it meant, in this case, running away. This is the situation, as best we can tell by reading in a little between the lines of this short letter. At some point, Onesimus decides that living as Philemon's slave isn't what he wants anymore, and so he takes off. It's possible he even stole something from his master when he went. Uh, something to make his fugitive life a little more tolerable. And somewhere along the way in his wanderings as a, as a fugitive runaway slave, he shows up at Paul's door. Now we don't know all of Onesimus' story. Was he a good slave? Was he a bad slave? We don't know. Why did he encounter Paul? Was he looking for Paul somehow? Or, or for some reason did he seek him out? Was it just a chance meeting? Again, we're not sure. But it does become clear in the letter that Onesimus undergoes a profound change, a change of heart somewhere along this journey. He becomes to Paul like a beloved child in Paul's imprisonment. He is useful, which is actually a play on his name. The Greek Onesimus literally means the useful one. Onesimus becomes a believer himself a child of God now Philemon is not just the master of this runaway slave Onesimus now he is Onesimus's brother in Christ no wonder Paul has to be careful here when he writes this letter but as much as we can figure out about Onesimus this letter really isn't about him it's about Philemon it's about who Philemon is and who Philemon might become. We already know Philemon is a beloved co-worker, committed to the good of the church in his community, but Philemon's primary, primary identity is now a child of God through Jesus Christ. So that new identity that he has, how does that impact him? How does that change the way that he approaches the world? Will Philemon be transformed? Like we noted, this is an unusual letter to have in the Bible. There's no real explicit doctrine here, theology writ large. Paul's not laying down the law here, even though he says a little bit later that he could. In fact, he's really careful not to do that. He doesn't want to overstep in the least. This is Paul being compassionate and kind, maybe perhaps a, a, a picture of Paul, a side of him that we're not used to, both with Onesimus and with Philemon. We're going to unpack that a little more in the weeks to come, but for today, I want us to reflect on what had to have happened in order for this letter to be written at all. 
Paul is incredibly diplomatic here, but he's still connecting with Philemon in a way that shows that Philemon may not be the person he once was. He's becoming something new. You see, one of the fundamental principles of Christianity is transformation. We become something new, something we weren't before. When Christ calls us, this is what happens to us. People recognize this all the way from the very early parts of Jesus' ministry. He represented something new. New wine wine that couldn't be kept in old wineskins. Christ's blood itself represented a new covenant. And Paul really understood this. You think about the experience that Paul had on the road to Damascus. He knows about transformation. He knows about being something before and being something totally different as he met Christ. And Paul consistently represents the gospel as something new. In Romans 12, he gets explicit about it. He spells it right out for us, telling the Romans to not be conformed to this age, but instead be transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they can discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In the second letter that he writes to the Corinthian church, he says this, what Gary read earlier. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, look. New things have come into being. Love that. Wow. Well, here's the basic thought. Human beings, that's us, Human beings are a mess. Sorry to say it. That's a fact. Humans are a mess. We are disordered. We are broken. We are sinful. And that's not the way that God wants it. God has a plan. God has a redemptive plan, a reconciling plan that will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. It will all come to perfect completion through his perfect son. But, and this is a critical point, this plan is built on the idea that we have to be something other than what we are if we're going to benefit from it. We have to be transformed. We have to be this new creation. See, you can't be redeemed and be the same. That's not what the word means. We have to become that new creation that Paul is talking about. Salvation and transformation are inextricably linked together. You cannot have one without the other. That's just the way it is. And this may raise some questions. I want to be saved, but what does it mean to be transformed? What's my part to play? What does God have to do here? What, how much of transformation is a gift of grace? And how much is dependent on my obedience? Do we ever get there to this new creation that Paul is talking about? I don't think I'm going to do each of these important themes justice in the, in the time that I have today, but I, I do want us to understand that, that basic principle, transformation is part of the deal when it comes to being a Christian. And it may be the hardest part. Salvation, that gift of grace, yes. I love it. Let's open that gift up. Let's enjoy it. Let's celebrate it. We're pretty comfortable with that. That's good. Sanctification, though, becoming who we are meant to be, becoming holy as our Heavenly Father is holy, that's trickier. You see, we like things the way they are. We don't want to change too much. We just want to do a little. Maybe clean up a little bit. You see, here's the thing. Fish don't pay attention to the water that they're swimming in, do they? They just swim in it. It's just around them. And we don't pay attention to the things that are influencing us as much as we could. On occasion, we might get our dander up about some cultural thing that surrounds us, uh, something that we don't like, sort of like a fish might get upset about a plastic shopping bag floating by in the stream. But for the most part, our culture is just the water that we happen to be swimming in. It's the context that surrounds us. And I'll tell you, we are deeply influenced by it. Just like a fish is influenced by the water that they happen to be in. But we usually just float through it without a whole lot of thought. 
I mean, who decides these things that are cultural patterns for us? I mean, who decides how many hours a week that we work? Who decides what kind of television programs we're going to watch? Who decides where our homes get built, where our stores are that we like to shop at? Where, who decides when we get up in the morning? Who decides that certain foods are breakfast foods and certain foods are supper foods? Who made that choice? Yeah, we can stop and think about it and process it and maybe trace the social, social and cultural choices back somewhere to, that got us to this point. But usually, we just accept those cultural patterns without much thought. It's the water that we swim in. It influences us. But what Jesus is doing, Jesus comes and challenges all of those cultural norms. Everything that we think is normal, Jesus says, is it? Is it really the way you should be living? I love this in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus does this again and again and again and again. He says, culturally, you have heard that it is said, do this, you know, live that way. But I say to you, and then he says to us, Culturally, you have heard that it is said that you shouldn't let people get the better of you. Don't, don't, uh, you, should, you should gather honor to yourself and avoid looking foolish and shameful. But I say to you, don't be afraid to look foolish for my sake. Culturally, you've heard that it was said that you should punish runaway slaves. That's what they have coming to them. You can't, you can't upset the whole system by, by forgiving them. They need to, you need to hold them accountable culturally. But I say to you, that slave may be your brother. And the only way that we're going to hear the way that Jesus is telling us to live, the only way that we're really going to understand this is if we are being transformed. If we really do live into that new creation that we are meant to be. You know, to switch metaphors here from fish to that classic caterpillar butterfly metaphor that we're all so familiar with. When Jesus calls us, he calls us to become something entirely new. And it's not enough just to try to clean up a little. To try to sort through a few things to be a little more moral, a little more just. That, that doesn't get us any further than taping paper wings on a caterpillar and calling it a butterfly works. What Jesus is really looking for here is a whole metamorphosis, a whole transformation in which that changed person becomes paradoxically totally new and yet still who they are. See, this is what grace does. This is the wonder of grace. Grace perfects, redeems, transforms us into what we are supposed to be. To become transformed into the likeness of Christ, we must be filled with the Spirit of God. This is grace. You see, because we can't do it on our own. We can't be moral enough or just enough on our own. And so God's intimate involvement in this process is essential but it is a process. Thomas Aquinas once said that grace does not abolish nature, it perfects it. I love that. I think he meant that the transformative process of the Holy Spirit, it, what, it, what, what the Holy Spirit makes possible, it's not a replacing of our nature, a tearing out of who we are and putting something else in its place, but really more of a perfecting of our nature as we, we bring that broken and flawed human nature into harmony with God's perfect nature as the Spirit indwells us. You see, nothing goes into that chrysalis, into that cocoon that doesn't come out of the cocoon, but it comes out changed, transformed, a new creation. And maybe our Christian transformation is like that, burning off all that brokenness and that sinfulness, redeeming that nature, creating something that is in essence new. But Paul's letter to his friend Philemon, it does indicate that we're talking about a process. I mean, think about this. If Philemon were already there, why would Paul have to write it? Paul's not sure where Philemon stands. Paul's careful 
He's carefully exploring the extent of Philemon's transformation. Just how far has he gotten? How far along this path? He wants to see how much of this new creation is present in his beloved co-worker. Because what Paul is presenting to Philemon is something of a test. How should he respond? How is Philemon going to react to his runaway slave? Because to the best of our knowledge, it was Onesimus that brought this letter home. Particularly now that Onesimus isn't just a slave, but also a Christian brother. So, is Philemon going to exhibit that grace-perfected nature? Is he going to show some of that transformation that Paul himself was so familiar with? Is Philemon really going to take these words to heart? Is he really going to comprehend all the good that we share in Christ? Or is that cultural water that Philemon swims in, water which sla- in which slavery is accepted and normal, in which runaways are punished because you can't upset the cultural apple cart that much, Water in which honor is way more significant than love. Is that going to be more influential than this new life that the Spirit has made possible? Now we do have some hints about how this played out. The fact that we have this letter in our Bible indicates that there was a positive outcome. But when Paul writes it, we're not sure. We don't know. But the real question here isn't so much what Philemon did. That's in the past. The question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to be more influenced by that cultural water that we swim in, or are we going to embrace this new creation that the Spirit is making possible in us? Are we going to let the patterns of the world the things that we're so readily and easily conformed to, are we going to let those things run our lives or are we going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Are we willing, though no one go with us, will we still follow? Are we willing to endure the ridicule and the shame from the world For the sake of God's glory. You see, this is what we're being called to, folks. Jesus is clearly calling us to live this transformed life. So how much of a new thing are we ready to be? Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy for us to lose sight of you and all the noise and the static, the cultural demands that surround us like the water a fish swims in. And Lord, we are uncritical at times, unthinking, unfeeling. We take it into ourselves And it affects us. It impacts us. It changes our behavior into what we could be, away from what we could be, into what you, you know, what you don't want us to be. Lord, when we've allowed this world to influence us more than it should, when we have allowed the patterns of this fallen creation to be what we are conformed to, we ask that you would forgive us. We confess that at times we have valued the things of this world more than we have valued you. So Lord, we ask you to continue this work in us, this 
recreation, this new thing that you are making, we want to see it in our lives and in the lives of our sisters and brothers. And we know that that requires our obedience. And so we ask that you would give us strength to work along with your spirit to becoming who you would have us be. Help us to be transformed, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Please stand and sing, Christ be in my mind. aspect of who we are in our mind, in our ears, our eyes, our mouth, in all the different components of our life, we ask that you would inspire and direct us because as we depart from this place and go into the world, we don't want to show them us, we want to show them you. Lord, we pray for those that can't be with us today for whatever reason that you would inspire them, equip them to be transformed in the way that is appropriate. And Lord, we thank you for the chance that we have to gather. We pray that you would be with us until we can do so again. Because we want to worship you. You are worthy of our praise. We pray all of these things. In the name of Christ, amen. You may go in peace. <laughs>